This is Nursing Care of the Child with an Alteration in Gas Exchange or Respiratory Disorder, Part 1. So, kids just get a lot of respiratory infections, right? They have colds all the time. It's the most common illness. It's, respiratory is also the most common reason children are hospitalized. And if you think globally, pneumonia is the most common reason children under 5 die other than during the neonatal uh, period. So why is this? Well, their anatomy is different. Their nose, uh, if you remember, they're obligate nose breathers the first months of life. So if you plug the nose, they just work really hard. They don't open their mouth and breathe through their mouth. They also don't make a lot of mucus, which catches some germs and prevents it from really invading. Um, so those things together make them more susceptible to getting infections. Um, they have very small nasal passages, really everything is small, and it's easier for it to obstruct. In the throat, their tongue is relatively large, and especially if we have them on sedation medicine or they have some sort of um, weakened musculature, they're at risk for that tongue um, causing an obstruction, so we want to be careful how we position them. And then children, their tonsils and adenoids are quite large and that makes them at risk for obstruction. In the trachea, again, it's just smaller, so it doesn't take a lot of mucus, edema, or a, a constriction bronchospasm to block things. And a very small change in the diameter will make a quite a big increase in the resistance to airflow and increase in the work of breathing. Um, their airway is more compliant, it also means it collapses more easily. In the lower respiratory structures, um, again, everything's short and close together, so it's easier for them to get res uh, aspiration. That, um, you know, you swallow wrong, it's right there into the lung very quickly. Things are narrow, so easier obstruction. Less alveoli make uh, preemies and young infants at higher risk for hypoxia. That chest wall is more compliant and they're more dependent on the diaphragm. Their metabolic rate is higher, which means their O2 need is actually higher, um, which again makes them more at risk for developing hypoxia. So some of the ways we give oxygen is with a head hood, a tent, a nasal cannula, mask, high flow nasal cannula, or endotracheal tube um, suction. We can use that bulb suction or a catheter suction. CPT, that's uh, where we do um, chest compression, chest percussion, sorry, not compression, percussion to break up and mobilize secretions. Chest tubes to drain things out that are outside the lung but inside the pleural cavity. And then a bronchoscopy is a scope to go down to pull something out if they've aspirated or just to look if we don't know what's going on. Here's a picture of the oxygen tent and you've got to keep that sealed that sometimes is also used for albuterol on um, babies who can't won't can't or won't keep a mask on. And this was a video of CPT if you want to watch it. And this chest tube I liked this is the kind we have at Valley Children's right your collection can section over here, your water seal, which makes it kind of a one-way valve, you can't get air back in, and then it's a dry section. So this is the section control, it's not that um, chamber of water over here. So it still works um, and makes suction, it just does not have water in it. And I wanted to show that because that's what we have at Valley Children's. So common drugs for respiratory disorders. Well. Um, you may be used to taking a cough suppressant. We rarely give those to kids. If they have a moist cough, they need to cough that mucus up and get it out. So we tell them good coughs. We don't tell them don't cough. Um, so the only time they'll use it is in a dry cough. And even then, most people are hesitant to get give a child a cough suppressant. Antihistamines, a lot of our respiratory things are triggered by allergies. Um, are inhalers for asthma. We have both short-acting and long-acting. The, the beta-2 
to adrenergics, right? We need to help parents understand which is which. One is for rescue, the other is for prevention and control. Inhaled corticosteroids, these are probably our best um, control for asthma, but those steroids put you at risk for oral thrush, so we want um, them to rinse their mouth afterwards. Decongestants, we don't give to children, um, usually we don't give them under six. Uh, there's been some bad outcomes, and so we, we don't use those, um, or very rarely. The leukotriene receptor antagonists, these are um, oral medication to help stabilize the the reaction in the lungs of a, an asthma attack. So this is things like Singulair. Um, mast cell stabilizers also to stop, to stabilize things to prevent that cascade that happens during an asthma attack, prevent it from, from happening. Uh, the mast cell stabilizers come both inhaled and oral, and that's things like chromalin uh, sodium. Respiratory stimulants we use with our, our infants who have apnea, and the most common one's caffeine. So what are some risk factors for respiratory illness? Well, being preterm, um, having some kind of respiratory dysfunction at birth, an uh, infant with poor weight gain uh, often has a res underlying respiratory problem. Recurring respiratory infections, again, there can be an underlying problem. And then environmental exposure to smoke. This increases um, respiratory illnesses such as asthma, bronchitis, bronchiolitis, pneumonia, otitis media is not on that list, ear infections, and it should be. Um, so when we do our inspection and observation of the respiratory system, the things we're, we're assessing for, we're looking for is the child's color. Are they pale? Are they cyanotic? Do they just have that cyanosis on the hands and the feet? Um, and we really want to look face a lot of times uh, that pallor they'll, or cyanosis, it'll start circumoral around the mouth. So the rate and depth of respirations, are they tachypnic? Are they doing a lot of fast, slow breaths? Um, the nose and the oral cavity, is there mucus in there? Is there an abnormal uh, shape in there? Do we have some anomaly to the structures? Uh, what's their cough like? And are there any other airway noises? Grunting is end expiratory so at the end of ex exhalation uh, uh, it's a way to keep positive pressure in there strider is swelling in the throat uh, and it's an inspiratory uh, sound uh, respiratory effort we're looking not just at the the chest we are but at the nose is there nasal flaring especially on our infants retractions that is the chest, that's where it looks like um, it pinches, comes in between the, the ribs uh, on each breath. I wrote in drawing there just in case you go to another country. In the U.S. we call these retractions. In um, other English-speaking countries like England and, and Australia, they call it in drawing. Um, and then head bobbing. Each breath the head goes up. Uh, anxiety and restlessness. Being air hungry is a terrible feeling clubbing of the fingers and toes uh, that takes about six months at least six months of chronic hypoxia and then hydration status when you're breathing fast you increase your insensible loss and also a lot of times these kids just don't eat well don't drink much uh, when they don't feel good so we've got to watch their hydration here's some good pictures showing clubbing and when you listen then, as you're auscultating for breath sounds, you're, you should be noting how much air exchange you're hearing. Is it decreased in one place? So that's, it's important to listen side to side and compare, you know, upper lobe to upper lobe. Um, is there wheezing? And if you hear wheezing, is it inspiratory or expiratory? Everything narrows and kind of relaxes and narrows a little during expiratory. So you'll hear expiratory wheezing usually first. If you're hearing it on inspiration, that's usually a bigger problem or indicates a bigger problem. Is it everywhere or is it just occasionally when they take a deep breath? If they do a big cough, does did it go away? 
rails. This is our crackles, right? This can be fluid in the alveoli or um, the alveoli slamming shut and opening up. It sounds like if you rub your hair, that crackly sound. Our book doesn't use the terms coarse or ronchi. Uh, Valley Children's does. They try and use the term coarse, but some old nurses will use ronchi. This sounds like a stuffy nose, but down in the lungs. You're hearing... <laughs> It's just moist. It sounds like mucus flapping around, which is exactly what it is. With that one, we've got to be careful, though, that we're not actually hearing mucus in the throat. If it's in the throat, it's referred. You're hearing it when you listen to the lungs, but it's not in the lungs. It's in the throat. So we want to try and get them to clear. Or what you'll see people do is put their stethoscope. Babies have no neck, right? You could put it on the neck, but on a baby, you can put it on the cheek. If what you hear here is exactly what you're hearing everywhere else, it's in the throat. Some of the lab tests that we do on um, kids with respiratory things. Pulse oximetry. This is checking how much, what percent of hemoglobin is carrying oxygen. It does not tell you that there's enough hemoglobin, though. Um, chest x-ray. We're looking for hyperinflation with asthma and RSV because they breathe in and then everything relaxes and, and they can't breathe out. And then they breathe in and then they can't breathe out. And that you can do that to a point till there's no more room to breathe in. And, um, you know, then we have uh, emergency. So we're looking that you'll see on the x-rays, it, they'll say it's hyperinflated. Atelectasis collapsed lung and even in things like RSV you'll get a plug that collapses the alveoli right there so you sometimes get little scattered areas of atelectasis. Consolidation, if you see that, that means pneumonia. We've got a solid patch of something there. Pleural effusion or empyema is fluid outside the lungs but inside uh, the pleural sac. Uh, pleural effusion actually is thin, empyema is thick. A lot of doctors just use one word, one term for both. Um, so you may see either one, um, and it could mean either. Blood gases. Pay attention on pediatrics. Is it an arterial blood gas, a capillary blood gas, or even sometimes venous? Um, we don't do very many arterial blood gases unless they're in the ICU and have an arterial line, so it's easy to get the arterial blood. We usually do capillary. If they're drawing other blood, they'll do a venous. In capillary venous, the O2 has already been used up, right? It's already been delivered to the cells. The other numbers really don't change, or the change is so minimal, you can go ahead and use those numbers, but you cannot use the PO2 if it's capillary or um, venous. Nasal pharyngeal washing. This is the test for TB. Um, they'll to call it for acid fast bacillus. We actually put down, usually, in, <clears throat> depending on the child's age, NG or OG, put in some fluid, um, whatever your policy is, water or a normal saline, and draw it back out. Do it first thing in the morning after the child's been swallowing their secretions all day, right? Kids don't cough up and spit out a sample for us. So we've got to get that sample in the morning when it's sitting in their stomach. Um, NP swabs. This is nasal pharyngeal, right? So it's way back, not all the way down oral pharynx, but just above it. So it's not just the tip of the nose. We're trying to get mucus from, you know, way back in that oral pharynx. Um, RSV influenza, those are done with that. So is pertussis. Pertussis is a bacteria. The others are viral. The medium you put that NP swab in is going to be different. So make sure you know, uh, what your facility uses for the swabs and the medium um, for the different uh, infectious agents you're testing for. Peak expiratory flow. This is a great um, device for asthma control. We have the kids every day, they get up, eat their breakfast, brush their teeth, blow in their peak flow meter. This is often the first sign they start having reduced peak flow. It's a hard, fast, Flow. We usually have them do three and see what their best was. Um, parents will start seeing that decrease before they have any other asthma signs, and that's when they can call the doctor and add something like Singulair um, and totally prevent a bad exacerbation. Sweat chloride test, this is the test for cystic fibrosis. 
and it's just what it sounds like. They test the sweat for the chlorine.